Let's talk about solutions that are not real numbers. So in 1545, there was a mathematician named Cardano, and there were many other mathematicians working simultaneously. And they saw that solving cubic equations, x cubed minus 15x equals 4, involved some radicals that gave rise to square root negative 121. Until that time, people didn't think that these radicals square roots that have negative inside of it served any purpose. But when they were solving these cubic equations, they saw that even though they had roots that involved negative numbers, when they actually solved the cubic equations, they actually resulted in real number solutions. So they wondered what kind of numbers were square roots of negative numbers. And what they found was very interesting, that these square root of negative numbers actually serve a purpose. In fact, square root of negative numbers serve a purpose in digital sound and physics and engineering. In many places, they serve a purpose. To understand the negative square root of negative numbers, we need to go deeper into what exactly are square root of negative numbers. So the convention is that we use the letter i, engineers use the letter j, but they mean the same thing. Simple way to understand it is to look at x squared equals negative 1 quadratic equation. You can see no real number square is going to give you a negative number. So we say i is the solution to this equation, which is negative square root negative 1, is designated to be a unit, imaginary, or non-real number. Even though we don't understand what the square root of negative 1 number is, we know it's square. Its square is negative 1. So i times i is negative 1. So we just expanded the set of real numbers. We added some additional numbers, which leads to the set of complex numbers, which you saw at the beginning of the semester. So complex numbers are a collection of numbers that are of the form a plus bi. a is called the real part. b is called the imaginary part. Just remember, i, what is i? i is square root of negative 1. So our real numbers are part of complex numbers, because if you let b to be 0, then a plus 0i, where a is a real number, constitutes the entire real number set. So our set of real numbers are complex numbers with the imaginary part being 0. Of course, a natural question would be, how do we do arithmetic with these complex numbers? You already know how to add and subtract them from before. So go ahead and pause the video here and see what you can do. Go ahead, you can do it. All right, so adding complex numbers, you will see that the like terms 3 plus 5i plus 2 minus 3i. So 3 plus 2 will give me the 5. 5 minus 3 will give me 2. So that's the, uh, the imaginary component. So we have 5 plus 2i. You're adding like terms. Similarly, for subtraction, 3 minus 2 will give me 1. 5 minus minus 3 will give me the 8i. Now, multiplication, again, distributive property of addition over subtraction or multiplication. So we have 3 times 2 is 6. 3 times negative 3i will be negative 9i. 5i times 2 is plus 10i. 5i times negative 3i will give me negative 15i squared. Remember, i squared is negative 1, so we have 6 plus i, plus 15, or 21 plus i. Let's multiply 2 plus 3i and 2 minus 3i. Go ahead and see what you get. Do you notice something? When you multiply these numbers, the imaginary part, negative 6i plus 6i, add up to 0. The negative 9i squared becomes plus 9, giving you 13. 
So these two numbers multiply and give you a real number. These numbers, complex numbers 2 plus 3i and 2 minus 3i are called complex conjugates of each other. All right, so complex conjugates are pairs of numbers a plus bi and a minus bi, and their product is always a real number a squared plus b squared. So if you are asked to do division of complex numbers, what do you do? Well, multiply numerator denominator by the conjugate of 2 minus 3i. So that will give you 2 plus 3i on top, 2 plus 3i on the bottom. Multiply term by term, and what we see is that 6 plus 19i minus 15, 4 plus 9 on the denominator, which gives you negative 9 over 13 plus 19 over 13i. This tells you that division of complex number results in another complex numbers. So when you have a set of numbers where add, subtract, multiply, divide, you get the number from the original set. Such a set is called closed under that operation. So set of complex numbers is closed under division. So look at that. That means that when you divide two complex numbers, you get another complex number. So look, we can see a pattern here then. i to the power 1 is i. i squared is negative 1. i to the third is i squared times another i, and so on. Do you see any pattern? Go ahead, observe the pattern when you raise i to different powers. What do you see? Good for you. Yes, what you see is that that i to power a number gives you either 1 or i or negative 1 or negative i, depending on if the number is a multiple of 4 or leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by 4 or a remainder of 2 when divided by 4 or a remainder of 3 when divided by 4. This will allow us to get different powers of i. So let's do i to power 401, which is i to power 400 times i. i to power 400. 400 is a multiple of 4, so that's a 1, so you'll end up with i. Or you can think of it as 401 divided by 4 leaves a remainder of 1, so it's going to be i to power 1. Go ahead, you do i to power 39. Yes, when you divide 39 by 4, leaves you with a remainder of 3. So that will give you i to power 39 as negative 1. Another way to think of it would be i to 39 is i to power 36 times i squared. i to power 36 will be 1, and i squared is negative 1. And so i to power 39 is negative i. Here's something interesting, square root of negative 81 which is the same as square root of negative 1 times square root of 81, or 9i. In this next example, we have square root negative 8, which would be square root 8i, i because of the negative square root. And 8 is 4 times 2, square root 4 is 2, so you're going to get 2 square root 2i. It's important to remember not to multiply two negative square roots and separate them out. For example, square root of negative 9 times negative 9, you cannot separate them as square root negative 9 times square root negative 9, because you'll end up with negative 9. But we know that negative 9 times negative 9 is 81, and square root of 81 is 9 and not negative 9. So it's very crucial that you can only separate the square roots if you have positive numbers on the inside. So two complex numbers multiply together. Their product is 0 if and only if either a is 0 or b is 0. This will allow us to now solve any quadratic equation. Let's take a look. All right, pause the video here. See what you can do with these problems. We've done similar problems before, and then we're going to build up. So go ahead, find all solutions to the following equations, and then talk about what are the similarities and differences between them.
So go ahead and do that on your own. Pause the video here, please. You are undoing powers. How do you undo powers? You take roots. So to undo squares, you're going to have to take square root. But we know that the square of a positive and a negative number gives you a positive 4. And so when you take square root, you're going to get plus or minus square root of 4. In other words, x can be 2 or negative 2. And you can see that because if you square 2 or negative 2, you'll end up with 4. If you do the second one the same way, look what happens. Just remember, square root of negative 1 was i, so we'll end up with 2i or negative 2i. The similarity is that we're taking the roots. They both have a 4 or a negative 4. The only difference is on the first one, because it's a positive 4, we got two real solutions. On the second one, we got two imaginary solutions. Next one is square root 5 because you're undoing the square, but then plus or minus, because you're going to get two solutions. You are undoing squares. Here you'll get the same thing, but square root negative 5 can be written as square root 5i or negative square root 5i. Again, the difference between 1 and 3 and 2 and 4 is that the first one, the radical simplified, and you didn't have any radical term left because square root 4 is 2. Whereas here, we could not really simplify the radical 5. It has to stay radical 5, square root 5. All right, pause the video here and try this next set. See what you can do, and then we'll discuss it. Assuming you've come back, let's take a look. Again, it's similar to before, so we're going to take square root on both sides. So we have x plus 3 squared equals 16. So when you take square root, you'll get plus or minus square root 16, which is 4. So x plus 3 equals plus or minus 4. How do we undo the plus 3? You'll have to subtract 3 from both sides. So it'll be negative 3 plus 4, or negative 3 minus 4, or 1, and negative 7. You'll do the same thing here, except instead of 4, you'll have a 4i. That's really the only difference between 5 and 6. Similarity is that you are undoing the squares. OK, so now let's look at 8 and 7. They both are similar to problem number 5, except there is an extra 4 sticking in front of the x plus 3 squared. So if I wanted to do exactly what I did with the x plus 3 squared equals 16, I'll have to get rid of the 4 first. So it's 4 times. So to undo that, I'll have to divide both sides by 4 and then take the square root. So I'll have x plus 3 equals plus or minus square root of 5 fourths, square root of 5 over square root of 4. Square root of 4 is 2. And then subtract 3 from both sides, which will give me negative 3 plus square root 5 halves or negative 3 minus square root 5 halves. You can do the same on number 8. The only difference is you'll end up with an i because you have a negative inside the square root. But look, 5, 6, 7, 8 have exactly the same principle, except if it did not fit quite the form of something square equals number, there's an extra coefficient 4 in front. We got rid of it by dividing both sides by it. And then it was the same thing. So it looks like. If we have some variable, a linear term, something squared equals number, we can solve because we can take square root on both sides and solve it. So that's just a summary of what we've done so far. All right, do 9 and 10. Because you can see, so actually, let's do it together because you have already done problems like that. So here we have, again, square, something square equals a 5. So I'm going to take square root on both sides. Solve for x, same thing here. So now let's see if you can solve 11 and 12. So pause the video here, and just note that everything you've done so far is all you need to solve these two problems that are 11 and 12. Go ahead, see what you can do. You are not allowed to say, I don't know, because I want you to try. It is OK if you do not get how to solve it, but at least attempt it. An attempt 
because by attempting it, you are actually growing your set of reasoning skills. You're using your working memory and all the tools that we have gathered as a mathematician so far. So pull those tools out. You can make a form I as only column. Write down all the tools that you can possibly use here. Go ahead. Pause the video. All right, let's see what you got. I know that if I had something square equals number, I can do that. But I have x squared plus 6x. It kind of matches x plus 3 squared, but not quite. So let's take a look and see. Remember we said hide things that create trouble. It's the 4 that was causing me trouble. What if I want x plus something squared? Well, the 6 gives me a hint. What if I looked at the problem above? It's x plus 3 squared. So let's take a look at x plus 3 squared. If you open that up, you will see that it's x squared plus 6x plus 9. By using distributive property of multiplication over addition, you can see that. And you know how to do that. But now look at our problem. We hit the 4 that was there. So if I had a plus 9, then I can do the problem. It will be similar to number 9, isn't it? All right, so let's take a look. So we had x squared plus 6x plus 4, and we want a plus 9. And it's an equation, so we're allowed to add the same number on both sides. So let's add plus 5 on both sides. So our original problem had a plus 4. But if I had a plus 9, then my problem would look exactly the same as problem number 9, isn't it? Look at that. That is genius. So if you thought of that, I, I know I am not there to congratulate you. But if you saw that, that is brilliant. So we are using what we currently know to actually help us solve problems that could not be solved before. They cannot be solved because we could have used zero property, uh, zero product property, but we couldn't factor x squared plus 6x plus 4. And so whoever thought of, like, wait a minute, it looks just like x plus 3 squared, except we need a 9. And then now I can solve the problem like before. So see if you can pause the video and try a similar trick on number 12. Let's see what we get. Go ahead, try it. I am not there to see your successes or triumphs, but I can definitely enjoy them from afar. So really, do try, because seeing how you are growing mathematically is just awesome to see. You can do it. Come on, let's go. Attempt it. Don't just sit there. Try it, even if it's wrong. I give you lots of praise just for trying. Just remember that. In my eyes, you are already successful if you're willing to sit there and try it. You've come a long ways now. Come on, let's go. All right, assuming you've tried that, again, it's 6x, so we need a 9, but we have a 14. So what should we do? We're going to, instead of adding, we're going to have to some take away some. How much? Good, 5. Take away 5 from both sides, and now we have x squared plus 6x plus 9, which will give us x plus 3 bracket squared equals negative 5, and then it's a problem just like number 10. So look at the similarities between 9 and 11 and 10 and 12. There's lots of similarity here. And so if you keep attention, making connections between two different looking things, that's what the STEM disciplines look for. Whatever you learned maybe weeks ago, years ago, and now you're in a different situation, learning something different or doing research on something, and you're like, wait a minute, I remember something like that I did a while ago, and you make these connections. So you may not know how to do a quadratic equation 10 years from now, but the skills of making connections between two different looking things, that's how inventions occur, that's how new research grows, that's how you can <clears throat> make things better for everyone. So keeping your eyes out for Connections between things is the most important key here. Look at how complicated of a problem we just solved just because we could make that connection. So this process that you just did requires that the coefficient of x squared has to be 1. 
because otherwise you won't be able to do this process where you add numbers so it's something x plus something squared. This process where you added or subtracted a number and got a perfect square on one side is called completing the square. And you're literally completing the square. So let's take a look at that process that you just invented here. All right, so take an example, x squared plus 6x. That's the one we just did. Do you remember how when we were doing algebra class, how you could visualize that? Go ahead and see if you can represent x squared plus 6x. Do you remember? Let's do one together. Here is x squared. And then 6x's. So we need 1, 2, 3. And I want to make it a square out of this. So if I just keep on adding 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I'll get a rectangle. And so to make a square, square has the same length and same width. So if I put 3 here, then the remaining 3 I'll have to put under here. So now I have 3 over here and 3. So it's almost a square, but there's a big chunk missing. So if I actually wanted to complete the square, I'll have to add 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's the 9 that you are trying to add so that you get x plus 3 bracket squared. Do you see why that process is called completing a square? Because it wasn't a square and you added things to make a square. All right, so you just do the completing the square process for x squared plus 4x. What number should we add, do you think, so it becomes a perfect square? From the picture, it was obvious. You can't just put them straight in a line, 1, 2, 3, 4, because you'll get a rectangle. You'll put half on the top and half on the bottom. And so then half of 4 is what? 2. 2 squared is 4. So x plus 2 squared. All right, try this one on your own. We have a negative now. It's the same process. Half of them will come from vertically, and half of them will come from below. And then you'll have to add to make it a perfect square. So half of 10 is 5. 5 squared is 25. And it'll be x minus 5 bracket squared. You see that? So in order to complete square, you take, first of all, make sure coefficient of x is 1. Then whatever that middle coefficient is, half of that, which is in this case negative 5, so you're going to make x minus 5 bracket squared. And the 5 squared, 25, is what you have to add to make it a perfect square. So let's see if we can use that now. So go ahead and try. So go ahead and try this example. Go ahead, pause the video here, use the completing square process, and solve this equation. Go ahead. All right, so dump the 34 on the other side, because then we have a chance of completing the square. It's x squared plus 10x. Half of 10 is going to be, what, 5. And 5 squared is 25. So add 25 to both sides. And that will give us, what, 59? So that will be x plus 5 bracket squared equals 59. Or x plus 5 is plus or minus squared with 59. And then our two roots will be negative 5 plus root 59 and negative 5 minus root 59. The square root 59 cannot be simplified any further, so that is your final answer. All right, see if you can pause the video here and do this next one on your own. Try it on your own. You've come back, so let's take a look. Again, dump the 34 to the other side. It will be negative 34. Add 25 to both sides. And then take square root. Square root of negative 9 will be plus or minus square root negative 9, which is 3i. So it be negative 5 plus 3i and negative 5 minus 3i. Pause the video here if this was too fast and go step by step. Rewind as many times as you need so you have this process mastered. All right, let's see. Three, try that one on your own. If you're stuck, you may be stuck because there's a 2 in front. So first, let's just rewrite it. Put the 10 on the other side. 
and wind would divide everything by 2. So if you do that, 2x squared over 2 will give you x squared, negative 10 over 2 will give you negative 5, and 10 over 2 will give you 5. So dividing both sides by 2 will give you this new equation. And now, wait a minute, how do I complete squares here? It's not an even number, it's 5. But that's OK, you just have 5 halves. So you're going to have 5 halves squared on both sides. And what is negative 5 halves squared? It's 25 quarters. So we have x minus 5 halves bracket squared equals 5 plus 25 fourths. You can make common denominator. 5 times 4, 20. 20 plus 25 is 45. And so then square root. And so our answer is going to be 5 halves plus or minus 3 square root 5 over 2. Why is that? 45 is 9 times 5. Square root 9 is 3, so you can factor the 3 out of the square root. All right, try. So final answer, just write 2. Make sure you remember the plus minus just means there are two answers. All right, do this next one on your own. Go ahead, pause the video here, see what you can do. All right, we have the same situation here. Divide both sides by 2. This time we get negative 15 halves on the other side. Again, half of the middle term. So half of negative 5 squared add to both sides. And add like terms. Create common denominators. And so our answer is going to be x equals 5 halves plus square root 5 halves i, or 5 halves minus the square root 5 halves. So. If I were you, I would be like, oh my god, it is the exact same process for 3 and 4. Why do I have to sweat this hard every single time? So think about how if you're a mathematician and you are doing the same process over and over and over again, you're going to say to yourself, oh, wait a minute, there has to be an efficient way of doing this. So we need to start thinking in a completely different manner. So. In order to be able to expand our thinking so that we could solve this generically for any quadratic equation, then we won't have to repeat our process over and over again. So we need a little more guidance as to how we can think about a generic quadratic equation. And for that, let's just see what happens next. So in order to think of quadratic equations generic form, let's take a look at how a quadratic equation looks like in the first place. So let's look at a specific quadratic equation. Specific means with some numbers. You could make your own up. Let's make something up. How about 2x squared minus 4.x plus 3.1 equals 8.3x plus 2.7x squared minus 5. So whatever you do, you must have a second degree term in it. Remember, no higher powers, but you must have a second degree term. So that's how a generic quadratic equation might look, or some version of it. You may have parentheses, something x plus something squared. Then you just have to use distributive property, multiply it out. So eventually, you might have something like that. But we can use arithmetic tools and rewrite that so that all the terms are on the same side. And in this case, it will look like that. Look at that. So we can take, no matter what quadratic equation somebody gives you with whatever numbers, you can rewrite it so that all the terms are on one side and 0 on the other side. And if you do that, it will be something x squared plus something x plus something. All right, so then what have we learned from this? We've learned that we can take any quadratic equation and make it look like something x squared minus something x plus a number equals 0. That's what we've learned from observing our quadratic equations. And so how can we represent a generic quadratic equation? Well, the something needs a placeholder for it, right? Because we don't know what numbers people are going to use. So we just said we'll use letters A, B, C. 
So we'll say ax squared plus bx plus c. a, b, and c are real numbers. Not only that, we can guarantee that a is not 0, because otherwise you will have a linear equation and not a quadratic equation. So we can represent generic quadratic equations there. That's a start. Well, now all we have to do is do the completing the square process for this generic quadratic equation. And then we can use whatever comes out of there. And all we then need for any quadratic equation is identify a, b, and c. And that will allow us to solve any quadratic equation. So let's take a look at the journey we've taken so far from the beginning. We first took equations of the type something squared equals number. We know how to solve those because you can just square, uh, take square root on both sides, plus or minus, and then we have our answers. I was like, well, if we can do that, then instead of x, we can rep replace those with any linear terms, like ax plus b bracket squared equals number, and I can take square roots on both sides. OK, well, then we said we can take a generic polynomial of second degree ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0 complete squares, and then we'll be able to solve. So that means we can solve any quadratic equation if you just complete the squares. So thinking abstractly like that of the process that you're employing allows you to get a better in-depth understanding of what we just did up until now. All right, so now the bigger task is to do what? We have to complete squares through generic polynomial ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. Let's review the completing the square process so that we can then apply that process to completing the squares for a generic quadratic equation. So the first thing we had to remember to do is have perfect squares, so it'll be something bracket square and equal some number. That's the form we need to get our equation in. And so in order to do that, we have to transform our original quadratic equation and how do we do that? Well, we complete the squares. So we dump the c on the other side. We complete squares and get it in the form something square equals number. Once you finish that transformation, then all you have to do is solve the resulting equation by taking square roots on both sides. So you have something equals plus or minus some number, and then solve for the variable. And in completing the squares, you always have to remember what? that the coefficient of x squared needs to be 1. So we are now equipped to solve our quadratic equation, the generic one. So our generic equation was ax squared plus bx plus c, and a is not 0. We need that, because otherwise you're not going to have a quadratic equation. The next part is to transform. So how do we transform then? To transform. We'll have to start with the original equation and dump the c to the other side. And then divide everything by a so that our x squared has coefficient of 1. So step 1, dump the c on the other side, divide everything by a so that the x squared coefficient is 1. OK, then what? To complete squares, we have to add something to both sides. So what do we need to add? Take the middle term, which in this case is b over a, half of that. Half of b over a would be b over 2a. So we need to add b over 2a squared to both sides. And if you do that, then the left-hand side is a perfect square. It'll be x plus b over 2a bracket squared. And then the right-hand side. The b over 2a squared is b squared over 4a squared minus ca. So for those of you who do not see why that right-hand side adds up to b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared, let's take a look. We have b over 2a bracket squared, which is b squared over 4a squared minus c over a. So we need to make common denominators whenever you're adding fractions. So that would be 4a is missing from the bottom. So we need to multiply top and bottom by 4a. That's where the 4ac is coming from. So that's why we have b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. Now what? Now solve. So to solve, we'll have to take square root plus or minus. 
square root of the b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. And then solve for x or subtract the b over 2a. So look, we have a square root which is the same as saying square root b squared minus 4ac over square root 4a squared. Square root 4 is 2, square root a squared is a. That's where the 2a came from. So the 2a here and 2a here, which means we can combine them together. So a generic formula for ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, the solutions are given by negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And so this is known as the quadratic formula. Very important formula because it will give you roots for all quadratic polynomials. And so a lot of people memorize quadratic formula, but remember, it's not a big deal if you forgot the quadratic formula. What do you have to do? Just complete the squares. Of course, if you have it, certain facts memorized in your working memory, then things just go a little faster. That's all. So if you can memorize the formula, I know that my students always tell me that there is some kind of song. You can look it up on YouTube, like Pop Goes the Weasel song, which people have fit to the quadratic formula. So you can sing it and singing and mnemonic tactics like that can help you memorize it. But for me personally, I didn't have a good memory and that's why I like mathematics because you can always just complete squares and not have to memorize any formulas, right? All right, so the quadratic formula we already saw is x equals minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. That part that is on the inside of the square root b squared minus 4ac. You can see from our examples that we've done, sometimes we get real solutions, sometimes we get imaginary solutions. So it discriminates what kind of solutions we get. So we need to mention a terminology that the quantity that's inside the root b squared minus 4ac is referred to as the discriminant because it determines the nature of solutions. How? If the b squared minus 4ac is positive, then we get two distinct real solutions. If it is negative, then we get two imaginary solutions. So we get i, basically. If the discriminant is 0, then there is only one real solution. In other words, it's a repeated solution. So like x equals 3, x equals 3. Or in other words, it's x minus 3 bracket squared equals 0. That's what it means. So it's a real solution. It's repeated twice. It's the same solution twice. And why is that? Because if you look, b squared minus 4ac, if this inside of the square root is positive, I'll get negative b plus or minus square root something positive. So there will be negative b plus that thing, negative b minus that thing, and the whole thing over 2a. Those are the two distinct roots. If the b squared minus 4ac is negative, I'll get a, something i. And so you'll get two imaginary solutions. If the b squared minus 4ac is 0, so it's gone, then you just have x equals negative b over 2a. All right, let's use our formula and see if you can do the following problem. Go ahead, pause the video here. You can either use the quadratic formula or complete the squares. Either way, solve the problem. Go ahead, pause the video. Let's see what you got. All right, assuming you're coming back, our a is 3, b is negative 2, c is negative 7. And so if we plug stuff into our formula, negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a, we get our solutions here. Just remember that always simplify all of your fractions and write them in reduced terms. So if it's square root 88, which is 4 times 22, square root 4 is 2. So 2 will come out of the square root. And then all 2 over 6 plus or minus 2 square root 22 over 6. You can reduce the 2 and make the 6 a 3. So our answer will be 1 third plus or minus square root 22 thirds. So it's very important that you see the value of that generic formula. We saved a lot of headache. We don't have to complete squares anymore because we just did it generically, and now we can just plug numbers in. All right, see what you can do here.
you know the drill. Pause the video, try on your own, then we'll discuss it together. Assuming you've come back, so A is 3, B is negative 1, C is 3. And so then let's just plug stuff into our formula. And we have a negative inside the square root. So that would be a i outside the square root. So you have a square root 35i. So our final answer is 1 sixth plus or minus square root 35 sixth i. All right, try this one on your own. Pause the video, see what you can do. If you've come back, and you use the quadratic formula, a would be 4, b would be negative 20, c would be 25. So here we go. Plug it into the formula. Minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And then reduce it. Oh, 400 minus 400, so that's 0. So we ended up with one solution. In this case, that would be 5 halves. So our solution is x equals 5 halves. I could have, if I noticed it, didn't have to use quadratic formula. Remember, you can just factor. In this case, you can factor, and it's 2x minus 5 squared equals 0. Our 0 product property means 2x minus 5 is 0, or x equals 5 halves. So remember, it does not matter what method you use to solve an equation. You have multiple ways as long as you get the final answer. And more than getting the final answer, you know what logical steps, mathematical reasoning you use to go from one step to another.